Well, joining me now from the Sky News Centre is Paul Fletcher, government frontbencher and the Minister for Major Projects. Thanks very much for your time this morning. Mm. First, on Mr Abbott's comments regarding refugees in Europe, are European countries, in your view, making a catastrophic error with the policy on refugees? Uh, well, I guess the first thing I'd say is obviously uh, uh, Tony Abbott, as a former Prime Minister of Australia, is somebody of uh, very substantial international stature. Uh, I think it's an honour for him uh, that he is giving this lecture and I think it uh, recognises Australia's stature. And clearly what he has been doing in this lecture is talking about Australia's experience, including uh, the work that he led, uh, including in the policy that we took to the 2013 election and then executed on in relation to uh, the uh, management of um, uh, people arriving by boat, uh, including uh, our policy commitment to turn boats back where safe to do so, and um, detention on uh, Nauru uh, and Manus Island. So I, I understood him to be making the point that there are lessons from the way that uh, Australia has managed this issue. Um, and I think it is uh, a uh, appropriate recognition of Mr Abbott's stature and indeed Australia's stature that he uh, is invited to give a speech or a lecture of this significance. Uh, is it appropriate for a member of the government, such a well-respected member of, of uh, the government, to be uh, giving such a lecture, uh, urging European countries, allies of Australia, uh, on, on what it should be doing when it comes to refugee policy? Oh, look, I certainly don't see anything inappropriate at all about uh, a, a very senior politician of Mr Abbott's stature, of course, the former leader of the opposition and former Prime Minister of Australia, uh, speaking uh, in this lecture uh, in the UK, drawing on the policy experience of Australia uh, under both the Abbott government and the Howard government, as he notes in his lecture, in relation to uh, this issue of how to deal with people who are seeking uh, to arrive in the case of Australia, typically by boat. Of course, the situation in Europe uh, um, not entirely the same, but, but some similarities, uh, and to uh, uh, draw out the policy lessons from Australia's experience. Uh, on the conflict in Syria and, uh, and Iraq, uh, Mr Abbott also urged uh, perhaps decisive action, and that may include special forces, Western special forces on the ground in those countries. Uh, this comes after the US Defence Secretary Ashton Carter suggested that uh, there may be a ramping up of operations, perhaps as he called it, direct action in the Middle East. Is the government considering taking further steps, uh, for example, uh, special forces boots on the ground in these countries? Look, I'll leave any comments on that to the Prime Minister and to Defence Minister Payne, uh, simply to say that clearly uh, the Syrian situation is an exceptionally difficult one. And one of the points uh, Mr Abbott made in his lecture overnight was that because of the uh, strong control of our borders in Australia that the Abbott government uh, achieved and uh, Prime Minister Turnbull uh, has reiterated his comments were a couple of weeks ago we can't take a backward step on this it's very important that we maintain our position lest uh, criminal people smugglers once again try and take advantage of weakness as we saw them do in the years of the Rudd Gillard Rudd government but the, the former Prime Minister Abbott made the point, and I think it's a powerful point in his lecture, that it was because of the strong border control, uh, border protection measures that we were able to take and the success we've had on this issue that in turn we were able to then offer 12,000 places for people uh, displaced by the conflict in Syria, people who meet uh, the uh, test of being a refugee and so uh, that humanitarian uh, action that the Abbott government uh, announced and that the Turnbull government is very strongly committed to, I think is uh, in part a consequence of the clear and strong management that we have shown on this issue.
OK, well, moving on, and the government has flagged a comprehensive innovation and science statement to be delivered by the end of the year. There's some suggestion uh, in media this morning that this could include tax breaks for companies that collaborate with universities and, and researchers as well. Uh, how, how would that work and, and what would the government be hoping to achieve with that? Well, look, clearly we are working on a significant policy package in relation to innovation. It's been a clear commitment of the Prime Minister and the uh, Minister for Industry, Science and Innovation, Christopher Pine, uh, has signalled the significant amount of work going into this area. Of course, Assistant Minister for Innovation, Wyatt Roy, is leading a, a mission to Israel uh, to learn from some of the policy successes of that nation. Bear in mind that We've already taken significant action, so the disastrous changes to the tax treatment of employee share ownership plans that were introduced by the previous Rudd Gillard Rudd government under then Treasurer Swan, which made it virtually impossible for start-up companies in the tech sector in Australia to use a standard remuneration tool uh, of employee share ownership plans, uh, incentives for employees. We reversed those changes with effect from 1 July this year. Assistant Treasurer Kelly O'Dwyer has announced that we will be uh, introducing legislation in relation to crowdsourced equity funding, using the power of the internet to efficiently raise capital. And it lets you do that in a way that um, uh, it becomes uh, possible to raise large amounts, uh, small amounts of money from large numbers of people. So capturing the efficiency of the internet in relation to crowdsourced equity funding. So there's a lot that we are doing. Yeah, the, the question was about tax breaks, though, mm. for, for companies that collaborate with universities and researchers. I mean, is there scope for that? Is, is that something that would... I mean, clearly it would help these, these innovators, help com companies, because right at the moment, Australia's at the very bottom of uh, OECD uh, countries when it comes to commercialising research. Clearly something needs to be done there. Australia has a very strong track record in research, as you rightly say. Uh, Commercialising research is an area where we aim to improve our national performance. We certainly have some great success stories. Uh, companies like Cochlear, for example, which took research done into hearing uh, and, and addressing hearing disabilities done at Melbourne University, and Cochlear is now a, country, a company with global revenues of some $900 million a year. So there are some great success stories, but we need many more. Now, in relation to your question of whether there will be tax measures included in the package, uh, I will leave that to the responsible ministers to announce the appropriate time, but simply to note that, of course, there's a whole range of policy measures that are um, considered in the innovation space around the world. Different countries have different measures, and, of course, we are having a good look at the different policy settings in countries as diverse as the UK, Israel, the US, Singapore and many other countries because as the Prime Minister has said we're in a very competitive global economy. Uh, every nation, every advanced nation is seeking to spur innovation. Uh, we are well placed to do that in Australia. Disruption, as the Prime Minister has said, uh, can be an opportunity and we need to treat it that way and the innovation package is a very important part of that. OK, just uh, briefly, the Prime Minister in Adelaide today is taking, taking a very big swipe at Nick Xenophon, uh, suggesting that he's similar to, to Clive Palmer uh, in Mr or Senator Xenophon's attempts to uh, pull together candidates uh, ahead of, uh, of the next election. Uh, that seems to me to suggest that the government's pretty worried that he may make an impact, particularly on uh, coalition-held seats. Well, I think the Prime Minister is making the point that as people uh, make a choice at the next election about a candidate that they want to support, uh, they need to bear in mind that um, candidates of uh, the Liberal Party, the Liberal National Coalition, um, uh, form part of, assuming we get the outcome we hope for, form part of a government, uh, whereas if you choose a candidate from an independent or a minor party, uh, they're not in the same position to deliver outcomes. So I think that's the parallel that he's drawing. Of course, uh, the coalition works constructively uh, with Senator Xenophon and other crossbench senators, 
uh, in the Senate, uh, but at the same time there are factors that electors should think about, that voters should think about as they determine which candidate is best placed uh, to advance their interests uh, and to speak up for them in Canberra. Paul Fletcher, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thanks, Dave.